Here are 12 tips and tricks the game doesn't tell you in Baldur's Gate 3. I've played around 100 hours of the full release and I feel like I'm still finding something new every time I play. So let's go over the 12 biggest ones that you might have missed from simple UI tips, combat tips, and then some secret hidden things to make the game even more fun. Starting with number one, a simple one, extending your hotbar. By the end of Act 1, you'll definitely find yourself with too many spells and abilities on any magical characters, and you might be constantly adjusting the little sliders to see your spells. But you can just press the button here and extend your hotbar to fit everything on screen. And you can do this on all your characters, so you'll have your spells, your abilities, and then any usable items as well, all on screen, all the time, no worrying about the sliders. Number two, pickpocketing. If you have a dex character, I use Astarian. Not only can you open chests and doors, but you can also pickpocket NPCs. You just sneak behind them and click pickpocket and then you roll on if you'll successfully sneak the item out of their inventory. And there's a small wheel and the more filled the wheel is, the more likely you are to get the item without raising suspicion. And if you're going for rings or cloaks or small little trinkets, you're gonna have a really high chance of getting these items. But if you've got a really high dex character, really set up for this, you can steal their entire stack of gold. I normally sell all my stuff to a vendor and then pickpocket the money back out, which <laughs> it feels crazy. But yeah, it's fun, something to do if you, if you wanna risk it. The next one's still about making gold. People you trade with have an approval bar and the better they think of you, the better prices for buying and selling. And at first it's not clear how to improve this. You might try doing quests for them and stuff like that. But the fastest way is just to give them a really good deal. If you just let them have a good deal. So for example, give them loads of items and ask for no gold in return, that approval rating will just, will just fly up and then you can trade and sell at a higher price and buy at a lower price. So it's really good if you want to, you know, set, if you want to, Give them a really good deal first, get the approval rating really high before you buy any really expensive items. It's really important in like act two, three, when the price of some of these things they sell is in the thousands of gold. Next up, books and dialogue. Reading books can seem a little bit pointless. Some are just short stories or little bits of lore and you might just skip through them, but it's worth grabbing them and having your character skim over them because you can learn new stuff about the world. And then in conversations, you can talk about it. So somebody might mention an ancient civilization or a piece of history and you can come in and talk about it because you've read it somewhere. Okay, next up, summons. Many characters can summon creatures. There's trinkets and quests that let your character summon different things. Necromancers can raise the dead. Druids and wizards can summon things like elemental creatures. And rangers get to summon a familiar. And then all of these characters can have a pet summon. So each character can have one pet summon with them. But you don't have to wait until combat to summon all of these things and they don't die after combat. You can summon and raise all these things after a long rest and keep them out for every single fight. So yeah, it, you can have every single person have a pet, which is really good. Some will have it from their spells and some you'll get the quest item and just give it to people that don't have a pet and you pretty much double your party size. So yeah, if you're worried about taking a, a spell slot for a summon and you're worried about wasting the very first move of the, of the round on summoning, you don't have to because you can just have them out all the time. Okay, on the topic of setting up for a fight, here's a big tip, switch your characters. You can switch characters mid conversation. So let's say you're talking to somebody and it looks like the outcome is going to be a fight. You can switch to other party members and reposition them. Get your rangers up high, get your warriors up front, activate your buffs. If you don't have anything summoned, get your summons out. Maybe launch a sneak attack on a rogue on someone who's really far away and get them out of the fight early. This can really help you set up for a hard fight rather than let the dialogue run out and then start the fight with all your characters just in a cluster ready to be fireballed by someone. You can also switch characters to distract one NPC while you do something somewhere else. So yeah, this is really important for the for the big fights where you've got a big room full of people. Okay, another thing in these situations is barrels. You can move these around as well before the fight. Using strong characters, you can drag a fire barrel right next to a group of mobs. You could drag a, you know, a, a grease type barrel right under a group of enemies ready for the big attack you're gonna launch on them. You can even carry these barrels around in you and then if you find a fire barrel somewhere, add it to your inventory. And then when you get into a fight, you can drop it. It's kind of cheesy, but it, it could be really fun setting up these huge one-shot openers. You know, drop a barrel, open up with a fireball, and realize you've taken out half the enemy team before the combat even starts. It's really fun. Okay, weapon dipping. You can dip your weapons into different elements to give it an effect. I didn't do it for the first act and a half, didn't even think, didn't even realize it was there. It's something subtle, but it adds that extra damage that really helps. But you can also dip into things like candles and they can be picked up in your inventory, dropped on the ground and dipped into. You can even dip ranged weapons in there to have uh, fire arrows. You can throw acid potions on the floor and then dip them into that. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways and you can, you know, you can right click your enemy examine them and see what they're weak to. And then if they're weak to say fire, drop a candle, have everyone dip their weapon into the candle. And now everyone has a boost against what the enemy's vulnerable to. So I think it's kind of, it's not something I do for every fight and it's kind of tedious to do this all the time. But if, if you've got a fight where, I don't know, say you're fighting a big group of something that's all weak to something, it's definitely worth dipping your weapons into 
Next up, bags. If you notice your inventory is getting a little chaotic, you can pick up these little pouches or backpacks and fill them full of items. You can have an arrow bag, a potion bag, a book bag, whatever you want. You can't color or name them, but they definitely make your inventory seem less cluttered. So yeah, whenever you find these little bags lying around and you loot them and then you leave them, just right click and pick them up. And now you can organize everyone's inventory as much as you want. Okay, now a magic tip. Lots of powerful magic is tied behind concentration magic. And if you lose the concentration, the magic spell will end. One thing I didn't realize is that's not just being hit. It means that if you cast two concentration spells, the first one gets cancelled because you can only have one active at a time. So if you're looking at your, your spell slots and say you're, you know, you're doing your level three spells and you take multiple concentration spells, you're not going to be able to use them all in one fight because you're going to remove the first one you cast. So I'll show like if you cast, say, stone skin and then you try and summon something, the stone skin will go off. So, yeah, try and have a good balance here of of each character having something they concentrate on before a fight. So maybe you you buff yourself or maybe you put up a big shield and then you have offensive magic after that. So yeah, that's how I do it. But yeah, try not to try not to double cast concentration spells or you're just going to waste your own slots and, you know, cancel your own spells. OK, now onto multi-classing. This, this is a big one. There are tons of classes in Baldur's Gate 3, but even more when you realize you can multi-class. So, for example, you could mix a rogue and a ranger or a paladin or a warlock or any other classes that you think could go well together. All you have to do is when you're leveling up, you click another class option and then you level through another class. The way this works is say you're on a rogue and you get to level five, you could go rogue four. And then instead of going rogue five, you go rogue four, ranger one. And then at say six, you go rogue five, ranger two. And then once you've unlocked your second class, you can choose which class to level up each time. It's really fun and it helps make both super powerful and you can make some crazy builds with this. If you're new to D&D or Baldur's Gate, this might be something for a second playthrough as it is a little bit confusing. But if you're looking to get really creative, you can have a ton of fun with multi-classing. OK, the last one's not so much a tip, but it's something really interesting. Baldur's Gate 3 has multiple endings. It was mentioned in an interview that it has around 17,000 different endings, which is kind of crazy. But that just means that lots of little decisions can feed into a little interaction at the end that is different. But not all of these endings are at the end of Act 3. You're, you can end the game much earlier. And they're not all just game overs. You can actually, there are some where you can actually beat the game in an earlier act. I won't show it or spoil it, but there's some really interesting ones based on certain characters and certain dialogue choices that are definitely worth watching. Maybe just like Google most interesting endings or best endings in Baldur's Gate 3, because some of them you just would not expect. But that's it. Here are, you know, the big tips and tricks that the game maybe doesn't teach you. I hope some of these are new or some of these you've, you've learned from. You've not heard this all before. I'm going to wrap it up here. If this video has helped, drop a like on the video and that helps me out. Subscribe to the channel for more tips and guides on all things RPG. And if you have any tips not covered here or, you, you know, some extra ones add into the things I've already talked about, let all the people know in the comments. Let's try and, you know, add, a, add some extra tips and some extra guidance because this game is huge and I'm sure there's still hundreds of things out there that I don't know. So, yeah, let everybody know. But that's it. Take care, everyone. And I'll catch you in the next one.